Hi there. Welcome to this session which is entitled Educating the Next Gen. And my name is Alex Dartley. I'm the Technical Course Lead at GameCamp. In this session I'd like to present you with uh, what we feel is an innovative, practical and fundamentally industry focused approach to education for the video game industry. Uh, the reasoning behind that approach and why we feel this educational paradigm shift is required for the good of the industry. So just a little overview of the general structure of the talk before we get tucked in properly. So firstly I'd just like to point out that while I am talking specifically about game camp and what we do, what I'm really presenting to you is our approach rather than you know just trying to sell game camp. Um, so the first thing we're going to cover is a little bit of background information to give some context and then some of the background to game camp and sort of how it came about, what its ethos is and some principles that underlie that. Then we're going to delve into the specifics of how we structure and deliver the course at Game Camp Pro, which is the Masters MSc and MA course. Um, and finally, I'd just like to explain why I think you should care about this. Um, not, not specifically about Game Camp, but about the advantages that our approach brings to everybody, and that's you know including you, hopefully. Okay, so um, there's a couple of caveats with this slide. Um, the first one is that I'm really focusing primarily on the programs with the programming courses in the detail that I give. But um, as I understand it, and based on the research that we've done at Gamer Camp, um, the situation is still relatively bad for artists and definitely worse for design, at least in the UK. Um, so that's the other caveat. It's essentially a lot of what I'm about to say is definitely true of the UK higher education system. And whilst I can't guarantee that it's true everywhere else, I assume that it will be at least similar. So the fundamental problem um, in the UK and, you know, likely everywhere else is that education and industry are quite misaligned. And the traditional courses, so again, talking about programming, computer science courses understandably focus more on sort of the cloud, hardware-less, virtual machine sort of technologies because that's the way big enterprise software is going these days. Um, and unfortunately, this has led to a real sort of worrying lack of focus on the low level and hardware issues. And um, you know, this was starting to happen when I did my degree in the mid 90s. Um, but now it's pretty much, unless you take option subjects, you don't get to talk to the hardware in any meaningful way. And you know, whilst it might be covered as a sort of general, you know, this is how an IP stack works, etc., it's not really a major component of, well, I'm not saying it's not a component of CS programs generally, but of a lot of the traditional courses, it's kind of been backgrounded. And then there's a similar problem, is that um, there are a lot of specialist courses which don't necessarily cover all of the things you might like them to. Um, and I'd, you know, I'd really like to say that this isn't just an opinion. Um, there's, there was a large uh, report done um, in the towards the end of 2010, it was published early 2011, called the Livingston Hope Next Gen Review. Um, and essentially, what they found was that um, whilst there are a, a clearly a handful of excellent courses out there, um, the large majority of higher education courses claiming to be industry focused. Uh, that's approximately 140 in the UK alone. Um, seem to not be that great. Uh, based on the statistics that the report had to look at. Only approximately 12% of the graduates from specialist courses found employment within six months of graduating, which obviously isn't great. Um, and then the same report surveys existing industry professionals and found that about 48% of existing industry professionals were from non-specialist kind of traditional courses such as computer science, physics, maths, engineering, and only about 20% were from specialist courses. So again, you know, I apologise for the kind of programming slant on that, but I mean that's my area of expertise. So. Uh, that's why I've kind of focused on that, but as I understand it, things aren't as great everywhere else. So this quote is from the 2009 UK Skills Assessment by Skillset, which is a government and industry funded organisation in the UK that represents the interests of the UK's creative industries and kind of organises uh, industry accreditation for training and education courses, amongst other things that it does. Um, so the point of this is that graduates are a risky proposition to an employer. And the reality of day-to-day -day game development in a working environment is vastly different from the educational bubble of undergraduate study. And the unfortunate reality is that even a very promising graduate who interviews well represents quite a significant risk for an employer in the game industry. Um, there's a lot of extra information to absorb and so many skills to learn in such a short space of time that fresh graduates typically mandate a significant mentoring overhead on existing senior staff and often don't become fully functional members of the team until they've been right through a game 
from kind of concept to completion. Um, you know, why is this? Well, I guess it's because the average graduate is mostly missing what, what this slide refers to as T skills. Um, and for whatever reason, it seems to basically take about a whole game's worth of development for these skills to sink in by osmosis. And then what personally I consider to be quite an important factor is that actually going through getting a game mastered and bug-free seems to kind of uh, forge these skills, as it were. So just to be clear, the T skills represent um, highly specialised core knowledge and then a sort of wide breadth of understanding of the general area of the industry as a whole. So just a little bit of background on how Gamercamp sprung about. So it, Gamercamp was the brainchild of Oliver Williams, who's the operations director for Gamercamp, and he's the associate director of the New Technology Institute in Birmingham, which is part of Birmingham City University, where we deliver Gamercamp. Um, the idea was kind of first cooked up in 2009, more or less as a direct response to that slide that I just showed you there, that quote from that document pretty much catalyzed the whole thing, from what I understand. Um, and the basic idea was to take students and put them in a simulated studio environment to give them T skills by putting them in a situation where they would naturally pick them up and then pushing them in the right direction to make sure they got it. So this was originally trialed as a sort of short course making iPhone games. Um, three trials of these were run, each of which was a massive, learn, massive learning curve for Game Camp. Um, and it, each one heavily influenced kind of how we managed the projects, how much creative freedom we gave the students, how hands-on to be with everything. Um, and so that's kind of honed it now into what we still do a suite of courses, so we still run the nano course. Um, but our flagship course is this Gamer Camp Pro, the Masters, uh, MSc and MA in Video Game Development. And that was always sort of the, the end goal that Oliver had in sight when he first thought of it. So our ethos is primarily to produce 100% work ready, workplace ready graduates. Um, you know, ideally we want them to be able to drop more or less straight into an existing development team with no more sort of mentoring overhead than you would have for any sort of regular member of staff who, who you pull in from anywhere else. Um, so it's an industry focused and supported course. The curriculum for Game Camp was designed in consultation with our industry partners. Uh, we use help them to establish the knowledge, skills and experience that their ideal graduate would want. Um, and this is for programmers and artists and this wish list kind of became the backbone of the course curriculum. Um, so we also have string, stringent entry requirements. So we have mandatory interviews and testing for artists and programmers. And then the real core part of it is the simulated studio environment. So we maximise the practicality and the industry relevance of a course and really try to create a situation where the students can really get the most out of learning T skills. And you know, a big part of this is we have multidisciplinary teams, so programmers and artists working together more or less constantly. We use wherever possible, we use industry standard tools and processes. And the students produce several complete games through from conception to completion, you know, getting them bug free. So actual three production cycles over the course of the year. Um, and our goal has always been to make Game Account Pro as close to a first job in the industry as, as possible. Um, so in theory, someone who finishes the master's course should have roughly the equivalent experience to someone who spent a year working in industry. And so principles, uh, I guess there's not a massive differentiation between these and the ethos, but um, so the idea is that we finish three games on three platforms. Um, all of the course is delivered by experienced industry professionals. And we maximise the workspace simulation. And a big part of this is minimising uh, the impact of training on the making of games. So um, we have an intensive training system. So at the beginning of each module, we have maybe a week of just constant learning. And that's all backed up with an e-learning portal that we video all of the lectures we deliver um, so that they're all there to be available all the way through the course. Um, assessment is based on a professional level of assessment, so we try to minimise and minimise invasive examinations and assessments. Um, and this also helps to prepare students by taking cues from real workplace sort of appraisal techniques and so forth. So the other part of it is we have workspace workplace professionalism. So we work nine to five. Students are expected to treat the course like a job. Obviously, this is within reason. We don't pay them. So, um, you know, the basic idea is that they should act professionally at all times. If, they, if they're not coming in, they need to ring in and explain where they are and all that sort of stuff, just like you would in a real job. Um, and so then the last principle is that we get industry involvement. So we have several industry partners um, who are mentioned on the website of GameCamp. Um, and they come in, deliver master classes, and they sort of bring relevant and up-to-the-minute content into the, into the curriculum that's, you know, in addition to the core stuff. 
uh, we get them to do mock interviews um, and we also get them to give realistic feedback on milestone builds of games the students are working on and the final games produced by the students. So as part of that um, industry professional team, uh, three of the core team staff are experienced industry professionals with over a decade of experience each and in total have over 40 years experience between them. And then the, the fourth person is Oliver who is the operations director and essentially the person who invented the whole thing. So Ian Harrison who's the art director and studio manager um, and the art course lead. So the other thing about this is that these roles more or less directly map between the academic side of things and the simulated studio. So Ian's the art director and he's the studio manager and he runs the art side of the course. Um, he's got 12 years industry experience. He used to work on micro machines for Supersonic many years ago and then he worked for Free Radical Design on Star Wars Battlefront. He's been working for Eurocom until quite recently when he joined GameCam. Um, Oliver's background is as the operations director. He's in software development and professional training and sort of education. So he brings all of that to the table. Um, our enterprise course lead and studio director is Guy Wilde, who uh, I used to work with at Codemasters when I first started in the industry about 15 years ago. Um, he was the producer on the original Colin McRae rally for Codemasters and then he worked there for quite a long time making their games and then went to start, helped start the Sega racing studio who made the Sega rally game. And so now he helps out as the enterprise course lead for Gamer Camp and then there's me. Um, and my background is I started off at Codemasters and then after leaving Codemasters went to work for a little company and then I helped start Freestyle Games who invented DJ Hero um, and so I was kind of one of the more technical people there. I helped write quite a lot of the low level systems and so on um, and so that's how I got involved with Gamer Camp. So the way that we manage the Gamer Camp system is we have three kind of core strands that form the basis of it. Um, programming, enterprise and art. Um, enterprise is what we call everything else that isn't specifically programming or art and these are kind of, the, this you know, this, this feeds into the T skills. So enterprise is like scheduling, time management, communication, teamwork, all of that sort of stuff. Um, so then the whole process involves simultaneous group learning. So the MSc and the MA students are basically learning together in groups for about 90% of the time that they spend on the course. And the two courses are completely symbiotic, um, they couldn't run without each other. And the learning objectives of, of each module on, on each course correlate and feed into each other. So the artists are producing the assets that the programmers need in order to make the game and the programmers are providing the tool chain and the support that the artists need to get their assets into the game. So this makes a kind of a nice symbiotic overall program. So just to really hammer home the T-Skills image, um, as you can see we've got Enterprise across the top which is the, the cross part of the T and then we've got the core specific skills that feed the upright part of the T. So this is for the code obviously um, and these are just indicative things, this isn't the total of the content that we have. So Enterprise we look at project management, source control, team dynamics, documentation, um, using initiative in appropriate ways, managing time, you know, commercial awareness, understanding design issues, um, and you know, code. We cover all the wide range of stuff that you would do in a real professional context. So, uh, kind of industry relevant level of understanding of C++, coding standards, system architecture, rendering, gameplay techniques, all that sort of stuff. Um, and for artists, it's much the same. They cover the same enterprise stuff, um, and then they get taught Photoshop, Maya, ZBrush. Uh, concepting and concepting is the kind of thing that we get external partners to help out with. Um, kind of character design, animation, skinning, you know, environment, all of that sort of thing. Um, so we've got the T, the, the horizontal part of enterprise, and then the deep specific skills that for the person's role. So the core structure is a standard for well, as I understand it, it's a standard thing in the UK. Um, it's five modules. The first two modules form the postgraduate certificate and each one of these you can actually take independently, um, well, incrementally. You don't have to do the whole course in one day if you don't want it. Um, so for the, in the first module we make a PC game uh, in small teams. This is just to kind of get the students into the swing of things. Um, and then the second module we make an iPad game so we're moving towards sort of a kind of realistic console environment. Um, so that's actually another thing that I've, I've probably skimmed over is that the focus of Gamer Camp is making, uh, is producing graduates who are um, capable at console development, have experience 
for that sort of arena. So not just games in general, specifically kind of console programmers and people who are familiar with the processes in making console games, so from the art side as well. So then modules three and four, um, three months in total, with approximately a month and a half on each of those two modules, obviously. Um, and that's the postgraduate diploma, which is a second chunk of the master's course that you can finish after or you know, so you can do the postgraduate certificate and then come back the next year and do the postgraduate diploma and then come back and do the master's or you can do them all in one go. Um, modules three, four and five actually feed into one really big game. So um, it's a PS3 title. Uh, we do R and D in module three, prototyping in module four, and then six months of production between sort of Easter and August for module five. So the structure of each module um, is basically the same. Um, so to start with, we we deliver the students a game brief. Um, and I'll, I'll go into why we give them a brief later a little more, but we give them a brief rather than letting them come up with their own stuff. This first step is usually at most a couple of days, and um, it's primarily to get the students to engage with the subject matter of the brief. And I found over the years that emotional buying is an invaluable factor in getting people to commit in, in group work and uh, if people don't feel like that their idea is valued or you know that, that they've had some input into it they're a lot less likely to put the hours in and so obviously that's really important for this whole project would fail if people weren't putting the time in so this first step is very important for that so once we've delivered the game brief we then go into a kind of intensive teaching phase um, actually I've skimmed over a little part of that is that we during the first part, we, we try to understand the game genre, we, we brainstorm around the, the general area of the brief, and we, we form um, an initial project plan, which is very kind of high level at that point. Um, so then we go into the teaching, and at this point we deliver all of the teaching for the module, and it's specifically tailored so it's relevant to the game brief. So we have core subject matter that we cover, that we will cover every year, and then we have extra stuff that we put in there to focus specifically on the brief that the students have got to deliver. And this is the point at which we generally try to squeeze in the master classes from our industry partners and try to bring in skills that are relevant to the brief for the game. And so once we've done the teaching, we then um, kind of reassess the initial project scope and plan. And that leads us into the development cycle. So for each, the development plan cycle is split up into, depending on which particular module it is, several milestones. We typically do a milestone every week or every two. So they're really sort of, we use a hybrid production system that's a little, so they're a little more like sprints than milestones. Uh, we call our production system Agile. So um, I think it's a fairly common thing that people use something between Agile and Waterfall these days. Um, we have a basic sort of plan, do work, sort of keeping up to date with daily catch-ups and so forth. Um, and then we assess the results at the end of that little cycle and replan. And this cycle is one milestone or spin or whatever you want to call it. And we refer to them as milestones. Um, but these are hung off an initial waterfall project plan that's built with sort of minimum viable project strongly, sorry, minimum viable product in mind when we when we build that waterfall project. And say so everything's heavily prioritised to make sure the minimum viable product happens, and then everything after that is kind of icing on the cake. Uh, we're building a lot of scope for slippage and trimming features, etc. Because obviously with students, you are more likely to slip than you would do with industry professionals. Um, it's just a natural thing. So this also brings up another case, is that you can't, unlike real life, although we try to be a simulated studio, unlike real life, you can't lean on people and make them crunch or anything like that. So we have to have a, a scheduling system, a production methodology that, that builds in realistic working hours as well. Um, which is obviously a good thing, in my opinion. If we can if we can teach people how to do things without resorting to crunch, then everybody will be better off for it in the long run. And so, finally, once the development cycle is kind of finished, we have the module assessment phase. Um, throughout the development cycle, we actually have uh, ongoing one-to-one -one tutorials and continuous observation-based assessment from the tutors. That's myself and Ian and Guy. We basically um, the tutorials are focused around um, sort of industry standard sort of techniques. So we kind of talk to the students, have a look at their work. Uh, they're very similar to appraisals, and we use them to set tailored learning goals and all that sort of stuff. And I'll cover that in a later slide, so I won't talk about it too much. So 
once we've done the um, finished the development cycle, move into the module assessment, a large part of that is actually assessed, as I've just explained, during the development cycle. Um, but then at the end of it, we did it for the game product, and that's theoretically a bug-free sort of game. Um, certainly the iPad module, the module 2, we, we submitted those to the Apple Store, and they both got through first go, although well, they're obviously not perfectly bug-free. Um, but you know they got into the Apple Store and that's good. So it shows that the process works. Um, and so one thing that I just kind of point out about all of this is that the the game brief and the teaching phases typically take between one and two weeks at most at the start of the module. And the the module assessment where we have this uh, Rabbit Viva Voce examination at the end, which is just a really sort of um, we try to make the assessment as light touch as possible while still being academically valid. So. We have oral examinations, which take maybe an hour to, for somewhere between half an hour and an hour per student. Um, the questions for which are determined by the learning outcomes that are expected from each module. And that whole module assessment only takes two days to do the whole cohort. So other than maybe a week and a half, two weeks of training and assessment, the whole rest of each module is made just purely working in teams making games. So. I guess this kind of begs the question of how we deliver the actual curriculum. Um, and that was one of the major concerns we had when we were trying to work out how to make the course. The way in which we managed it, and the way in which we do manage it, is essentially by splitting the curriculum incrementally, as I guess you necessarily would, across the learning objectives of each module. Um, but we've, we carefully did that so that we can then tailor the scope of the game briefs we set for each module. So each module produces some kind of game product. So even the modules three, four, and five, which are parts of a game, there's you know R and D sort of technical demos for module three. For module four, there'll be a prototype of a game, and for module five, that's the full game. So there are still products at the end of each module. And by carefully tailoring the scope of the game brief that we set, and the well, even when it's not a game for the R and D, the brief that we set for each module, we can make sure that we cover all of our curriculum topics. Um, and we can also make sure that any extra teacher that we need on top of the core stuff is delivered at that point. So another key feature in the way that we deliver the curriculum um, is to, because this is you know practice-based learning, so the students are primarily working in groups and as you would in a real sort of studio, making team, uh, making a game by working in a team, they're communicating with each other, they're kind of having meetings, the learning processes. Rather than just sitting them down, as you would if you worked on your first day of a new job, and just saying, here are the procedures, and forcing them to adhere to them kind of um, dogmatically without any sort of buy-in from them, the key feature of our approach is giving the students opportunity to make mistakes, um, and then you know we back them up to make sure that their mistakes don't cause problems for the game long term. Um, and we manage this by adjusting how hands-on we are with the production processes. Uh, certainly in the first two modules, we give the students lots of space to mess up. Um, and then when we do introduce the procedures later on, it becomes a lot more obvious why they're beneficial, and the students are actually kind of clamouring to get procedures because they can see the problems that they fall into when they don't have them. So our assessment as well, which I guess is a, a, another problem, another question that is sprung to mind on you know, just learning in teams. As I've mentioned, the assessment is, is intentionally fairly light touch. And a key part of it is the fact that we the students learn in teams, but they're assessed individually. So a student's grade reflects their academic understanding of the subject matter, as you would hope with it being a master's course. Um, and the quality of both their output and their contribution to the team. So in principle, it's possible, though it's not likely in practice, for a student to get a very high score even though, even if the game that they were working on as, a, as part of a group ended up being unfinished or of poor quality, it's theoretically possible for students still to do well. So 70% of the work on each module um, comes directly from the game briefs and is assessed via these one-to-one -one tutor meetings that I mentioned earlier and kind of ongoing observation of team behaviour and so on. So these one-to-one -one tutor meetings, which are a key part of the way that we manage the assessment, are very, very similar to um, professional appraisals that you would have in the workplace. We discuss the students' work, we identify the areas of their odd area, we identify the areas of strength and areas that they may need attention in. Um, and we agree action points 
tailored towards individual learning that kind of make sure they're going to meet the learning objectives and also push them in the right ways. Um, you know, so if they're a little weak at some aspect of programming, we kind of set them a little bit of extra work that they can maybe do at home and demonstrate that they're actually getting the hang of that. Um, and the grades we give are based on a well set of, on a set of well documented formal guidelines, uh, which are partly based on professional industry, industry standards, but they also obviously have to be based on academic criteria in order for it to be a master's course. So a lot of it, you know, to get high marks, has to be critical evaluation and critical critical reflection demonstrated in professional levels of um, understanding and all that sort of stuff. Um, so then the final 30%, in addition to the 70% from the ongoing assessment, is based on, as I explained before, these viva voce oral examinations. Um, and this system works really well for us because the students get to focus on making the game and all of the benefits that that brings working as part of a team and honing their T skills um, and just generally getting better at making games and working together. And because this all exam only takes half an hour to an hour per student, um, we get through the whole cohort in a couple of days and it's it's really good. Um, I definitely recommend doing it. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's a good thing. So this is actually the first year that we've run the Gamer Camp Pro course. Um, and I just thought I'd share with you some of the stuff that we found over this first year before I kind of get to the conclusions. So in module one, as I explained before, we made a PC game. Um, the teams in this were very small, two to three students um, from our current cohort. Um, and we gave them a very simple brief. So this year we actually got them to do um, a kind of modernized update of Space Invaders. But the, the basic idea was to keep it faithful to the original's gameplay and art style, and just add maybe a couple of features to make it a new game. Um, so we had a very simple brief. The scope and planning was enforced during the training phase, so we, were, we taught them how to break a project down, how to kind of guesstimate, because obviously they don't, being students who never made games as a group before, they don't really know how fast they work or what the limits of their ability are just yet. So we kind of taught them we teach them procedures for how to kind of guesstimate based on experience that they have had. Um, and we really do, we enforce that scoping and planning stage very tightly. Um, and then we get them to show us what they think they're going to do, and then we kind of rationalise it back to what we feel is an achievable amount of work during the time they've got. Um, we also give them a project management sort of technique. Um, we, we give them a spreadsheet-based system at this point, um, encouraging them to kind of fill in their hours and track the tasks and so forth, but we don't actually enforce any of the production management side of things because it's a deliberate thing on our part. We want to actually let them see what happens when they don't keep a really tight handle on it. And then we have, um, because it's quite a short game, that this, this PC game, because there's more training in this first module because we have to make sure that the students are all up to the same level of understanding. We, we, we take two weeks for the intensive training in the first module, so they have less time to make this game than for other games. Um, and so it's important that they get kind of a weekly feedback to make sure that they're staying on target. And part of that is um, we encourage them to replan and rescope their games to make sure that they're going to still have a realistic amount of work to get done and produce a viable product by the end of it. But we don't enforce that. And so I guess what happened is what you would expect. Um, every single team overscoped for the available time massively to start with. Um, we probably trimmed two thirds of the features out of each one um, to get something that we thought might be achievable in the time we've got. Um, the planning and scheduling, because it's not enforced, it falls apart after week one and um, most teams ended up, I wouldn't say running around like headless chickens because that's unfair, but they, you know, they, there was a lot of um, panicking and bad communication because we weren't mandating any uh, particular production process on them at that point in time. And um, the final thing that happened is obviously by going through the process of messing things up um, and seeing what happens as it falls apart. Everybody learns some valuable lessons about why you should do things a different way or you know that there must be some better way to do things than the way that they've been trying to do it. So in module two we incrementally um, improve the processes that we're asking them to follow uh, and the management and that kind of hands-onness of that management. 
So in module two, larger teams, um, in this case seven to eight students per team, and we set them a theoretically achievable brief at the time they've got. And by theoretically achievable, I mean I felt and uh, the art lady and both we both thought it was theoretically achievable with people of our level of experience doing it. So clearly, it almost it wasn't achievable for students. Um, and then we applied. This is where we start to apply the sort of proper white art production methodology. Um, and we also used Handsoft for managing that. And we enforce and facilitate planning and scheduling and have daily scrum meetings and, um, and formal sprint reviews during this module. So it really does, we kind of step up the ante in terms of process management to try and make sure that they've got a better chance of meeting the final product by the end of it. Um, and part of that, again, is we start off with light touch management, and then we increase it as we go. That was our theory. Um, and surprisingly, a very similar sort of thing happened again. So because we enforced a much more structured planning phase, the first sprint was on, across all of the teams was very good. Um, they seemed to be hitting, hitting, or if not hitting what they were aiming for, at least having a very good idea of how to reorganize to make sure the slippage was minimized and what they could drop from each title. But after that first sprint, because of the light touch, the deliberate light touch, chaos occurred. Um, and until we started rigidly enforcing the procedures and applying strong direction, because obviously Ian and I, as well as our, our as well as being the art lady, and it's essentially for the course, Ian is essentially the art director for the, the game studio, for the virtual game studio. And I fulfill a similar role um, for the technical side of things on so the technical course, but I'm also effectively the technical director. Until we really started getting involved and, and insisting on things and pushing them um, to communicate and decide and kind of keep track of what they decided, it really started to fall apart. And once we once we started using sort of proper industry processes and teaching them, you know, the ways in which you need to organise yourselves in order to get a team to work effectively together, things started to work a lot more effectively. And again, everybody learned a lot of important lessons. The feedback that we had from the students was universally that they could see how everything fell apart and they could see why it fell apart and once we'd started enforcing the project the um, production processes on them more thoroughly towards the end of the game they could really see what the benefits of that were and how they'd gone wrong before that. So that's what we've got to so far. We're currently in module three um, and what we're doing at the moment is we're part of the PlayStation first educational program which is run by Sony Computer Entertainment. Um, and we're working on some internal IP for them, as essentially as an outsourced prototyping team, I guess you could call it. So we have master benefit to this. We have uh, contact with with Sony staff, uh, master classes for them, helping us helping the students kind of learn how to use PS3s and so forth. Um, and we have semi-formal ex external assessment of all the milestones. And for this for this the rest of the course, we're strictly adhering to. Um, our industry derived processes that we use, so our Agile hybrid management system and really enforcing best working practices. So for example, the programmers don't just start writing code. They communicate, they design, they peer assess, they do code reviews, all of that sort of stuff, kind of real actual workplace practices. Um, and the, the process for getting this game finished is a three-phase process. So we're doing R and D at the moment. Um, and obviously one of the big advantages of being an academic course is that we can take our time and do things properly. Um, obviously, in real life, you probably don't get to spend as long on R and D as you would like. So we're we're teaching them the way in which we feel it should be done, um, making sure that we set strong goals for research and development, making sure that we have a very good idea of exactly what we want to find out and how quickly we we want to find it out in, uh, what the timeframes are for, and that sort of thing. And so the R&D will feed directly into the prototype and producing the technology that we need to make that prototype. And then the prototype will be a sort of, of a, again, prototype based on that technology, but it, it will be maybe less, because it's only a six-week module turnaround, it may be less fully featured than a prototype would be in the real industry environment where the prototype can take as long as it takes to some extent. Um, once we're kind of happy that the the prototype is, has been prototype goals have been achieved and we've answered all the questions we wanted to answer about the gameplay and so forth, we're then going to move into the 
sort of full production, which is module five for six months. And the end goal of that is to make a sort of vertical slice or demo that's kind of at a level where it would be good enough to show to a green light into an internal green light meeting to get the game approved for green light. So that's basically what we do during the year and how we go about trying to make sure that the students um, do that in a sort of industry relevant and, and industry um, correct working progress manner, I suppose. So finally, I guess I've presented you with um, why we're doing it, what we do, and you know this is the kind of last part where I tell you why I think you should care. So if you work in the industry, really, um, you know, there's the there's the altruistic line, which is you know give something back to the people who are following you into the industry, make sure that they get a running start, and that you know you don't get green graduates coming onto your team who don't know anything that cause you trouble, check in bad code, break perforce, or whatever. Um, but more importantly than that, um, you get to ensure, as a company and as an industry, we get to ensure that the skills that we need are available. Um, we get to as an industry partner to a course like Game Camp, you know, you could get to meet and observe prospective employees in a situation where it's it's not an interview, you can really see what they're like. Um, their guard will be down, you know, you get to see actually what they're like, you get to see what their work's like, how they interact with other people. And this in turn, since you know you can have an ongoing relationship coming in and assessing milestones and giving master classes, you get a chance to recruit graduates potentially from the course with minimum risk. Um, financially and to your time because you get to know them, um, you get to know what the strengths and weaknesses are and, and because you've been involved with assessing it, it makes it very easy for you to do that and reduces the risk for everybody. Um, another thing which is perhaps a little bit cynical but you know definitely worth thinking about is you, by being a partner for, one, for a course like GameCamp, you get access to cheap prototyping resources. So if you've got a game that's been on the backbone or some technology you wanted to develop and you don't have the bandwidth to do it in-house, you can get it done through the course. Um, you can have loads of keen students champing at the bit to do something exciting and dangerous and bleeding edge. And you know, as long as you set up the IP agreements carefully with the course, there's no reason why you can't get them to work on internal IP. Um, and so finally, you know, there's from an industry point of view, you get professional development. You get the advantage of professional development opportunities for your staff that they might not be able to get within your company, uh, especially if your company is quite a small company. You might have topped out on designers or topped out on um, positions for your programmers to rise into. Doing this sort of thing allows you to kind of train people in mentoring and train people in um, assessing sort of milestones and getting involved with vision holding and other sort of management here activities that are kind of difficult to get people involved with without some risk if you're not sure that they can do it. So that you know, there's lots of good reasons to get involved from the industry. So if you're a student, a course with this approach um, offers you a lot of really big advantages, probably more so than it offers the industry people to some extent. So one of those, the first of these, and possibly the most important, is you get a chance to develop your T skills outside of the industry. And as I mentioned before, T skills from a students' point of view are not impossible to come by, but unless you actively seek out teamwork and really, you know, get involved in extracurricular teamwork. You're, you're unlikely to develop T-skills to the level at which you would really need them to find it easy to get a job in the industry. Certainly, you know, a couple of years industry experience, which is what a lot of companies ask for, is basically because that's how long it takes for these T-skills to develop. And that couple of years comes down to one development cycle, in my opinion, mostly. Um, another big advantage is you get a fully supported academic learning environment. So, you know, you get to fail and you won't get sacked and we give you the support you need to get better. Um, you get one-to-one -one mentoring from industry experienced professionals, which is the same thing you would get if you were working in the industry. Um, but that's our job, rather than being something we have to do as well as work. So you know you get our full undivided attention for a minimum amount of time every week. And you get 100% up-to-date course content because you've got industry people coming in and, and delivering bleeding edge content to you and explaining how they do things on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, because we make three games over the course of the year, one of which is published on the uh, Apple Store, Apple App Store, is you know you get three games for your portfolio, and um, even the PS3 one, which is done under um, under wraps and NDA. A big important part of that for us was that Sony were happy for students to be able to take away a demo of that at the end of it and show it to prospective employers. So you know even though it's done under NDA, there's no reason why you can't take that demo and show it to people. Um, 
you get to learn from and work with industry experts, so the master classes, and you know, you get to make contacts. So not just from people coming for to to deliver master classes and kind of assess you from external industry partners to your course, but you know, the, the people who are teaching you almost certainly still have their fingers in the industry to one extent or another and you know, if there's jobs come up they'll be able to kind of point you in the right direction or put in a good word for you or whatever, that sort of thing. So from a student's point of view it's it's obviously great because it's kind of the closest thing you can get to a job without getting a job, if you see what I mean. Um, so, you know, the final part of why should you care is if you're an educator. If you're an educator, it's my opinion that you've got a moral responsibility to maximise the employment prospects of your students. Um, you know, they're paying you to take this course. You really, morally, if not from a point of view of uh, making people come and be go on your course in the first place, you know, you want to maximise the employment prospects of your students. Um, you also want to make sure that the industry that you're supporting is around to employ future graduates in years to come. So, um, getting stuck in with the industry partners really make sure that you're teaching the students the skills that the industry wants and needs. Um, and you know, finally, I guess, again, being a little bit cynical, it just makes pure commercial sense. If no other reason, if you're uneducating the establishment, it makes perfect commercial sense that if you're getting high graduate employment, then you're going to get more applications for your course, and so you'll make more money for it. Um, you know, that's just obvious maths. Okay, so, in summary, um, the approach that we use at Gamer Camp is, is a practical and common sense approach for education, or at least I feel it is. Um, you know, you students end up with a year of having worked in a simulated workplace environment as part of a multidisciplinary team, which you matter no matter how no matter how you cut it is as close to working in real life as it can be. Um, you know, obviously that's the core focus of what we do. Um, you end up with directly relevant experience. So in the case of our students, they're going to be familiar with PS3 dev kits, export tool chains. You know working with all of the same sort of tools that everybody works with in real life. And they're going to have rounded T-skills. Um, there's a safe environment for students to fail in and to get better. And obviously, even with the best will in the world, it's it's not a good idea to fail when you're on a real job and you're getting paid for it because that could cost you your job if you're on your probation. Um, and you know the ongoing industry involvement with the course guarantee, well, guarantees it makes it much more likely that your course will be relevant and will be providing to the needs of industry and catering to the needs of the students as well. So industry, academia and students should all benefit from this approach to education. And I, personally, I just don't see how it cannot be the future. So I, I guess that's me finished. So um, I'm ready for questions. Awesome. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, yeah, so uh, if there's any questions, you can ask them in the questions box, and we'll get them to them just now. Uh, so Jessica has a question to kick off. Uh, so you said that you have a sort of nine-to-five expectation with your course. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you take into consideration that students need to earn money? So talking about sort of casual okay, part-time so, yeah. jobs. That's a completely valid point. Um, so we have a nine to five expectation, but that's actually four days a week rather than five. Um, so weeks nine to five, Monday to Thursday. Friday, obviously Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Saturday and Sunday would be free, that stands to reason. But we also, we don't work Fridays, or at least the students aren't expected to come to the, to the course on Fridays. And obviously if somebody needs to take the odd afternoon off to work a shift or something, you know, we have to be flexible at the end of the day. Um, we can't mandate that people do come in, but the general idea of the course is that Everybody treats it as if it were as close to a real working environment as possible. So obviously, you know, you have to allow for people to have some leeway on that. But it, yeah, in general, we try to insist on nine to five, but we're friendly and flexible about it. So Adrian asks, uh, are you familiar with the criteria students who apply for the art department need to pass? Yes. I am, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm involved with interviewing for all for all the interviewees for Gamer Camp. I mean, I mean, I might not be an artist, but um, I'm, yeah, I'm involved with the interviews. So I'm, I'm assuming that what you want to know is what those criteria are. Um, so essentially, it's it's the criteria for getting on Gamer Camp are very similar to getting a job in the industry. So um, you'd need to be familiar with 3D modeling, um, ideally Maya, but you know we we have the facility to teach people how to use my obviously. So if you know Max instead, that's fine. Um, we, the first bit of the first module, as I explained, was a sort of conversion course. So as long as you can um, draw, you need to be able to draw, obviously. Um, 
and you're familiar with 3D modeling and um, you know you are artistic you know, <laughs> ultimately I guess that's it we, you know, we asked for a kind of strong portfolio ideally kind of having produced game assets before um, you know a good strong demo reel showing you are to the best of your um, ability is really what you need to do um, to get onto any art course and we also have a test which I can't tell you what the test is obviously because then it wouldn't be a test um, but it's 3D modeling and then of some description um, and we use that to kind of to check the kind of level people are at. So the majority of, our, of the art students that we have have come from um, either sort of some sort of pure art background like graphic design or computer animation or they've come from one of the game specific art courses. So that kind of that's sort of the background that we require for artists. Uh, Mike's question is, you talked about students working as part of industry. Are those students paid in any way for, for the work that they do? Uh, no, no, no. Obviously, um, it is an academic course, and like any course, um, you pay tuition fees. Um, the games that, that are made and released on the App Store and so forth are all released completely free. Um, we don't make any profit out of any of the games you make. Um, you know, there have been discussions, obviously, about um, how this sort of thing works when you're working directly for an industry partner, like the work that we're doing with Sony. Um, but ultimately, things get very, very complicated if the students expect to get paid for the work that they're doing. Um, obviously, if they, if they, if the students do very well in the, in the case of this year, there is a potential that if, if the game that we're working on is really good and Sony like it, and there's a potential that some of those students will get employment out of it. So it's not like it's completely negative that you don't get paid. Um, you know, you are students after all. I guess is what I would say to that. Uh, Mark asks, uh, how do you assess student teamwork? Uh, is it some sort of peer review process that you use? Um, a little. There is there is a peer element to it, but it's not necessarily. Um, peer review as such. What we basically do is Ian and I are in and around the office pretty much constantly um, and we look at how people are interacting with each other, with each other and we look at um, the ways in which people are um, communicating with each other and, and sort of who's getting work done and who's not getting work done and if people aren't getting work done essentially the one-to-one -one tutor sessions enable us to um, in private with each member of the team, ask questions about how they've been working and what they've been doing based on the observations that we make when they are working. And that enables us to kind of offer them advice about how they might be able to work better as part of a team. Um, if, they're, if, you know, if they're not working well as part of a team, we kind of offer them ways to work better. If they're, for example, having conflict with the members of the team, we, we, we sit down and we talk conflict resolution strategies with them and the ways to work with people who you don't get on with and that sort of thing. Um, and they become essentially learning a, a we're not learning objectives, goals for them to achieve. So, you know, if we've sat down with someone and said, you know, you're not working, you're not communicating well, you're refusing to listen to other people's points of view, you need to start listening to other people's points of view. Then at the next tutor meeting, if they haven't started listening to people's points of view still, then we, we basically um, do it by asking them to do things and pushing them to make the right decisions. And then the marks are based on whether they do or don't um, kind of get better, if you see what I mean. So, you know, some people are really good at teamwork and actually other people need more help. Um, and so we do have criteria which are set out in the learning objectives for the modules and that's people are assessed directly against the learning objectives but also um, by using this kind of one-to-one -one peer review in combination with observing their behaviour, as it were. I hope that makes sense. Makes perfect sense. Uh, so there was a question about shorter versions of the course. Now, yeah. from the way that it's structured, uh, I think that my understanding anyway is that uh, you have your postgraduate diploma, then your certificate, and then the full master's. So I yeah, guess the right. question sort of boils down to is the scope for just a, a one portion of that to be offered, like the second, you know, if you just want the uh, skills yeah, that you would learn yeah, yeah, from yeah. the... If, yeah. yeah, yeah, so you, you can do... Um, you can do the postgraduate certificate or, and you can do the postgraduate diploma and you can do the masters separately but they are incremental so you would need to do the certificate and then the diploma then the masters 
you can't just you can't just pick and choose. You can do one at a time, um, but because the course runs for a whole year, you would it would take you three years to do it in a compartmentalised way.